You know, it's funny, it's one of those things where today I was just unsure about what to do tonight and all that kind of stuff. I knew we'd have short time with the sun going down and everything else with people getting off work and and do we go on to the next discipleship lesson? I was like, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. So I just like, okay, well what's what's the psalm today? You know, like what's you know, if you if if you guys don't know, if you read five psalms a day, get to the whole book of Psalms in a month, just like Proverbs. So if you're going to Proverbs a day, five chapters of Psalms, get through the whole thing. It's really cool to see as you do that, the patterns that emerge. Well, today just happened to be, happened to be one with Psalm 75 in it. And I read it and I'm like, and I get down to like verse four and verse five, and then I get to verse six. And verse six, especially for promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. And and I'm immediately thinking, okay, oh my goodness, that's ordained, getting ordained. Friday, we're ordaining Randy Borg up here. And we talked about the source of authority all day Sunday. And it's just one of those things where it's like, why is God really want us to be paying attention to this? And... I think the reason is, finally, I read this today in a book. There's always some jerk who doesn't get the message. <laughs> it's a quote from World War II. It's a common saying. Um, that quote is from World War II where vital communications were almost always the greatest hurdle. Right? Somebody always missed it. They, didn't, they, they just they didn't get the significance of it. Um, you read story after story of an admiral's instruction going coming across as a suggestion and rather instead of a command and as a result thousands of lives were lost you know just things like that happened all the time and the communications became so so important that a rock pigeon used to communicate a message and this came out of one of rockwell's books the other day used used to communicate a message resulting in the successful evacuation of a town received a medal from the government because the pigeon was the only way they could get the message through. They evacuated the town and saved the town from getting from everybody from getting killed. And so he got a medal. Well, in our psalm today, which is going to be Psalm 75, if you want to turn there, um, there's nothing new or especially difficult about it and, and about the authority that it talks about, except that it bears repeating. Because there's always some jerk who doesn't get the message, just like me. I've read that thing a hundred thousand times and it never dawned on me. That's talking about leadership. It's talking about how to be a good leader, how to be authoritative and not an authoritarian. Right? To be authoritative means you, you know what you're dealing with and you have the equipment to be able to handle it. Being an authoritarian means you do it my way or the highway and you don't have any idea what you're doing. Right? And that's a, that's a bad place to be. So, believer, don't you be the one that doesn't get the message. Speaking to myself, Philippians 3.1 is a great example of the fact that sometimes God has to repeat himself for us to get it. Philippians 3.1 says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you for me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Look at chapter 4 and verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. And what's our first verse? Psalm 75 verse 1. Unto thee, O Lord, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks. For that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. I'll tell you, you know, we talked a lot about Sunday, about how suffering is sometimes God's stamp of approval. And the more resistance you meet, the more you know you're on the right track. Well, sometimes that's how you know he is near, is because of the difficulties that arise. And there have been plenty of those recently. You know, the drama with the, the, the finances, with the, the silly... Um, uh, insurance thing. I mean, what is that about? And then everybody gets in a wreck. Everybody has a car breakdown. Everybody has, I mean, it's just like one thing after another. And 
you're probably on the right track. <laughs> you're probably in the right place. You're probably getting ready to do the right thing. And that's exactly what, what we see here. It says, unto thee, O Lord, do we give thanks. We'll just read the whole thing, and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. It says, we give thanks for that thy name is near thy wondrous works declare. When I shall receive the congregation, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it, Selah. And I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly. And to the wicked, lift not up the horn. Lift not up your horn on high. Speak not with a stiff neck. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth one down and setteth up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, and it is full of mixture. And he poureth out the same, but, but the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. But I will declare forever, I will sing praises unto the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked also will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. So <clears throat> first thing you want to see here in this, in this chapter is the cry of valid authority. This is David talking about when he would judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, David is also a type of Christ, especially when you get down to verse 3 and you realize the millennial import of the passage. This is Jesus Christ getting ready to judge the nations after the tribulation. When all the earth has been destroyed and he's having to rebuild the thing. And he's bearing up the pillars thereof. So first of all, let's talk about the name that is near. Right? He says, for that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. Look in Luke chapter 1, verse 33-33. That's the, that's the name that is near right there. Luke chapter 1, verse 30 through 33. And the angel said unto him, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. That's exactly what you're seeing in this passage. That's him inheriting the throne of his father, David. And his name is near, verse 33. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's exactly what you're seeing over here in Psalm 75. That is the name that is near. And the reason he might be near, there are several times in the Bible in which you can point a finger as why he might be near. The first one is if he has a bone to pick with you. Look in Isaiah 50. Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah 50, verse 5 through 9. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ and what he is thinking while on the cross or it, during his trial. It says, The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore I have set my face like a flint. I know that I shall not be ashamed. All right, so here now in verse 8 is his challenge to his enemies. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. And who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. Verse 9 says, Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they shall wax old as a garment, and a moth shall eat them up. And he's referring there to the fact that eventually his enemies will be gone, even though he's getting ready to be crucified. He was still going to win. And he says, he is near that justifies me, so let my enemy draw near. 
And it's funny, you'll meet him there when you're struggling with whether or not to be saved. He has a challenge for you. Try and whip me. You try and win the victory over sin without me. You try and win the victory. I'm the only one who was rebellious, was not rebellious, and did not turn away back. I'm the only one who went through it pure. So yeah, you want to fight with me? Come, come to me. I'll, I will, uh, I will win that contest. That's exactly the challenge that he's making. And understand, that's the, the, the first reason why he might be near, is because he might be wanting to wrestle with you, right? He might be wanting to pin you down on some issue. But there's also another reason why he might be near. <coughs> Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 8. It says, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. The fact is, when somebody is ready to get saved, his name is right there. It's just right there. It's available. It's like falling off a log. They know exactly what to do and what to say. You don't have to prompt them much. Exactly the surprising thing with the little one back there. I didn't have to hardly tell her what to do. I mean, set down, hands folded. <laughs> what are you doing? Pray like that. She did. She did the whole thing. I mean, it was, it was really cool. But at the same time, the fact is when somebody is ready to get saved, he is near. His, his word is right in their mouth. His, it's right in their heart. They're ready to go. They are ready to call upon the name of the Lord, as the next verse says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And that's, what, that's how that gets in there. That's how you're made ready. That's how you're prepared. Is you've wrestled with him, and now you're ready to confess him. Now you're just you're ready to get knocked over. And that's, that's another reason why he might be near, which prevents you from meeting him the next time he might be near, which is in Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Because if you meet him like this, it's real scary. Because he's not going to come meek and lowly. Matthew 24, verse 29 through 33 says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is, by the way, the fig tree is Israel, just so you know. When his branch is yet tender and put forth his leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, know it is near even at the doors. See that? It is near, even at the doors. And that's the, the next time you'll meet him, which by the way, doctrinally, is exactly when this is taking place. It's at the end of the tribulation, when the Son of Man has appeared and is now set it on his throne, and his name is near. And he's having to uphold the pillars of the earth to keep him from sinking. Because this earth just went through hell. Okay? That's exactly what you're dealing with over there in Psalm 75. And the reason in this passage that he is near is because he is judging the nations and to rebuild the destroyed earth. Look at Matthew 25, just one page over. Matthew 25, verse 31 to 35. This is one of those things that we always read about and I don't know that we necessarily pay attention to it but remember over there where he talks about not lifting up the horn 
Well, he's going to deal with some animals here who have horns. Okay? Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory with, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And therefore shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them, the one from the other, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye my blessed of my come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Okay, that's what he's going to say to those who did not lift up the horn inappropriately. But now, if you look over in down in verse uh, 41, you're going to see what he's going to say to the goats. And he shall say unto them on the left hand, Depart ye from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. See, these, they've got a place prepared for them, right? Both high and low. God has prepared a place for all of them. God is very prepared for all of these things. Look at verse 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. You'll find that in the New Testament, we are never called the righteous. We're never called that. Jesus Christ is called that. He's the righteous. And we have our righteousness from him, so it's not ours. But in the tribulation, they will be called the righteous because they will have made white their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And if you look down here in Psalm 75, in the last verse, it says, And all the horns of the wicked also I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. So you see to whom he is talking is the same. Same group, same people, same thing. That's what you're dealing with. So that's in this passage is him judging the nations after having fulfilled the Matthew 24 passage. Which then results in him being the scourge of every authority. This is the scary part of being a leader. Is that you'll have to stand before him someday and give an answer for how you led. Verse 4. Specifically, men, that's us. Ladies, keep your head down. Because <laughs> y'all don't have to deal with that. We do. Okay? Lucky you. Verse 4 of Psalm 75 says, And I said unto the fools, Deal not foolishly, and to the wicked lift not up the horn. Lift not up your horn on high, speak not with a stiff neck. So, the first thing you have to understand is he addresses two people. He addresses fools, and he addresses the wicked, and talks about them in their authority and in their pride, that they do not lift up the head. First thing you have to understand is that God is the source of every authority. Every authority. Look at Romans chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. Now we got an election coming up, don't we? Guess what? He's going to give us exactly what we deserve. Which is why I often say, who you vote for doesn't fix anything. I'm not saying I don't vote. I'm saying vote. But who you vote for doesn't fix anything. What you protest against fixes more. Because most the, the reality is it's the lesser of two evils. Neither one is ideal. It's a coin toss as to which one will bring us down finally. <laughs> I mean, they're all running the right direction for that. Romans 13.1 says this. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. Now that's a blanket, absolute statement. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Blanket statement. Every single one of them. He says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth 
the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So, you can fight the law, but the law will win. It's just the way it is. You can object, you can let them know, you can be a conscientious objector. Absolutely. Speak your peace. But if it comes down to him bearing the sword, don't resist. Don't resist. Now remember, when Paul writes that, who is in power? It's on your page. Nero burned Christians to light his garden. And he's saying, don't resist. Submit. He's the power that is ordained of God. Because as we have seen, our suffering forwards our cause. We are far more effective witnesses. We're more effective children of God when we are having a difficult time of it because we have to rely upon him to make it through. We have to rest in him or it won't get done. And that's when we're strong. When we are weak, we are strong. And that's really the, the lesson that you have to learn is, and for every leader, they have to learn the same thing, no matter what you lead, whether it's a t-ball team, your family, the, the golf association, or a church, or a Bible study, or a, a mom's group, or whatever you're leading. Sunday school class, understand you work best when you're relying upon him most. If you think you can do it, you don't rely upon him as much as you need to. And that's, and that's the thing. You've got to trust. You've got to rest. God is the source of every authority, including Nebuchadnezzar, greatest type of the Antichrist in the whole Bible, probably. And Donald Trump, who as we'll see, is a proud boaster, which is one of the main characteristics of the Antichrist. Neither side is great, I'm telling you. That both of them are just a, a, a hair's breadth from bringing the world down. So the fool, first of all, needs to know who he is. Psalm 14.1 says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. So a fool is someone who inside doesn't really believe there is a God. Now, he may say with his mouth that he does, but his heart is not with thee. Understand? The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. He doesn't say it necessarily say it out loud. There's lots of people who are near to God with their mouth, but their heart is far from him. There's lots of people who live their lives like practical atheists. Right? They live their life to no better than a dog. They provide for their family. They, they go out and work and do a job, but they live no differently than an animal. Because God's not a part of anything that they do. There's no transformation in their life. They're just checking boxes. And that's all that their life is. That's not the way we are supposed to live. We have a living God who does interrupt our day and deal with us on things and make sure we're going the right direction and, and Trent and changes our life and our path and takes us places we would never have gone without him. And that's a, that's, that's a huge part of it. Uh, Hebrews 11, 6. This is, the, this is the opposite, okay? This is the life of, of faith, right? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But what he needs to know, this fool, who's going to stand before Almighty Jesus Christ one day, who's going to stand before him in his throne of glory, he needs to know this. Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If he would have led rightly and read pro led properly, he would have not acknowledged that God is, and he would have sought him out in the process to try and figure out how to do it and where to go and, and all these things. That's, that's the process, right? That's a valid authority. So he tells the fools where they can get off. Jesus Christ warns them, if they're still there, many of whom will not be still there. They will have been cut off long before this. 
He says to the fools, deal not foolishly. Guys, don't act like I'm not here. I'm sitting right here. Okay? Then he says this to the wicked. And to the wicked, lift not up the horn. The wicked need to know who the true power is. Now, this is where we're going to define what it means, what the horn means. Look at Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Back in chapter 3 and verse 4. It says, And his righteousness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. So when you see a ram and his ram's horn, it's a symbol of power. Anytime Israel was to go out to battle, they would blow a ram's horn. It was a symbol of authority. It was a symbol of, 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 of might. And that's exactly what it is. It's the, the hiding of his power. So when you see the horn on, say, for instance, the beast, look in Daniel chapter 8, you'll get the meaning. And there are many of these beasts that have horns in the book of Daniel because he's dealing with the authorities. He's dealing with principalities and powers. Daniel chapter 8, verse 3. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there, was, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. So he's talking about kings. He's talking about powers. He's talking about authorities. And as we'll see, he goes on to talk about uh, the, the rottenest one of the group, who will have his neck broken. See, what those wicked need to know is that Christ is the true power. So when he tells them to don't lift up the horn, he's saying, keep your head down, boys, or I'm going to cut that thing off. It's exactly what he's saying. Okay? Which is the best position for a Christian to be in. On your knees, on your face, down below. How low can you go? It's the best place to be. Look there in verse 7, or excuse me, verse 5. It says, Lift not up your horn on high, speak not with a stiff neck. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. Well, what direction did he leave out? The north. Well, you found out what's in the north in the next verse. But God is the judge. There's who resides in the sides of the north. Right there. But God is the judge. He putteth one down and setteth up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But he's the one who puts one down and sets one up. He is the judge amongst the nations. He is the one who tells the wicked where he can get off. Because he's the one in charge of promotion. He's the one in charge of authority. It doesn't matter what time period it is. He is in charge of the authorities. And if he doesn't like one, he'll put them down. And if he likes another one, he'll put them up. And if it, and it's, he's getting them to accomplish his purpose. And that's the way it is. He's forwarding his kingdom. And so you can trust him. But what they should do for wisdom, as it says there in verse 5, is lift not up your horn on high, which is, by the way, the second time he says it, Lift not up your horn on high, speak not with a stiff neck. Now, anybody who's read through the book of Proverbs any amount of times, there's a famous verse in there, Proverbs 29, 1, which says, He that being often reproved, didn't he just reprove him twice? He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. You want to know what a stiff neck is? It's a football player's neck. From constantly banging heads against the other side. They get those big necks on them that they can't, they can't hardly turn their heads. Right? And it's from being bullheaded. Right? It's from running too fast and not being able to turn and not being able to. And so as a result, what happens? You exercise that power and authority so much, eventually you can't turn your head anymore. Right? 
So what he says is don't be stiff-necked. Stop butting your head against the wall. Stop butting your head against the wall. You need to speak. You need to have a soft neck. So they need to be careful how they speak of ultimate authority because look at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, you find the stiff-necked one. Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, 14. It says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom, before them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So in other words, they've been taken down. God set them down. And behold, in this thorn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was as white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool, and his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, Thousand, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. See the horns being dealt with by he who sits upon the throne? Verse, not, verse 11, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. There he is speaking great swelling words. Right? I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame prepared for the devil and his angels. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, and yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. See that? That's exactly what you got going on. He's warning them against lifting up the horn. Verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Huh, I think this is a parallel passage. His name is near, and there was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. See there? There you have it. So be careful how you speak of ultimate authority. Don't speak evil of the king. No, not in thy bedchamber, the scripture says. For a bird on the wing will tell it. So just watch out what you put on Twitter. I'm saying. The redeemer of every authority is then found in the rest of the chapter. Look at this. This is, this is really cool because this is exactly what Jesus did, the things that he did for. Verse 8 to 10. It says, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, and it is full of mixture, and he poureth out the same, but the dregs thereof of the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. But I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked also I, will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. Understand, first of all, they will answer to the cup of the lamb. Well, what cup was that? Well, Matthew 26, 39 will tell you what cup that is that he has in his hand. It is the cup that would have delivered them. Matthew 26, 39. It says, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will but as thou wilt. You know, anyone who wants to be a good leader and a right leader, that's where you find it, in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you, as, as 
as the quote I heard when we were down there uh, from Brother Grady, if you can stay awake in the prayer meeting, you can sleep in the back of the boat. And that's right. That's exactly right. If you can stay awake in the prayer meeting, if you can stay awake all night with Jesus Christ, you have no problems being in the boat when the winds and the waves start kicking up. And for those leaders and those guys there who were looking for promotion or to be put down or whatever they were going to get out from his hand, if they had come here first, they would have been fine because he took that cup of the Father's wrath for them so that they would not have had pride lift them up and they would not have spoken great swelling words against valid authority. Psalm 68. See, this was always a part of it. You know, we think of, oh, you know, so-and-so did this or so-and-so said that, and that just, they just can't be redeemed. The only thing that can keep you from being redeemed is rejecting his sacrifice on your behalf. That's it. You can do anything else. You can be the worst henchman of the Antichrist that's ever been. And if you will take hold of that cup before he is near or in the wrong way, then you're fine. He can redeem you right out of that. And it'll happen. There'll be lots of people redeemed out of that. Look at Psalm 68, verse 17 through 18. It says, The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. So you know... It's the same context, right? He's sitting on his throne. And look at what it says. He says, Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men. Yea, for the rebellious also. See that? Not just for the good guys. But even for some of those kings who were fighting against him, he'll... Be merciful to them for a time, a season and a time as you saw it. Just like when David took over, or excuse me, when Solomon took over the throne from David and he let Abishai and some of those guys live. Now they didn't last too long because they lifted up the head and so he lifted their head off of their shoulders. But he's a type of Christ sitting upon the throne of his father David. And that's exactly what's going to happen when Jesus Christ comes and sets upon the throne of his father David. Some of those guys are going to get in. He's going to be merciful to them just so that all some flesh can be saved alive. And they're going to go in rebellious. They're going to go in by the skin of their teeth. And he's going to be merciful to them for a season and a time unless they decide to lift up the horn and lift up the head, at which time he will whack that sucker right off. All right? <clears throat> he says thou hast received yea for the rebellious also that the Lord God might dwell among them because if not who would stand right if he does if he's not merciful and if he's not gracious we could none of us could stand we talked about that Sunday morning right none of us could stand we're called not according to our works so do your best to stand the right way do your best to not be rebellious, to do, it the, to, to do the things that you're called to do the right way. Revelation chapter 14. This is, I think, is one of the saddest things in the whole Bible. And I remember when I read it the first time and really caught the significance, I could probably have read it 50 times before it hit me. But Revelation 14, verse 9 through 10 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. There's that cup. He took it for you, but since you rejected it, now you're going to take it from him. And he shall torment, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, exactly those same ones that came with him, those thousands of chariots that came with him, same context. And in the presence of the holy angels, look at this, and in the presence of the Lamb who was slain for them. 
They did not have to go there. They did not have to end up how they ended up. They need to be warned because there is a cup that would deliver them. And that's the cup of salvation. There is a cup of the land that they could have taken instead of being burned. Verse 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. They, and here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And that's salvation and the tribulation right there. You've got to keep his testimony and you've got to keep his commands. But then look back over here at Psalm 79 or 75 again, and we'll be done. Verse 9 is David praising God, and then verse 10 is Jesus Christ ruling in his authority. Verse 9 says, But I will declare forever, I will sing praises unto the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked also will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. See, both Jesus and David ruled by their integrity. Just like we talked about on Sunday morning. You rule validly by integrity. By doing the right things, doing things in an upright fashion, and holding no secrets and pulling no punches. That's how you rule and reign in God's kingdom. That's how you lead in God's kingdom. Look in Psalm 78, just a couple of pages over. Also, if you were reading it today, you'd have read it, read this too. Psalm 78, verse 70 through 72. Says, he chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. He was a leader of sheep. Verse 71. From following the ewes great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. He promoted him. See that? See that promotion? He's promoted him from being a shepherd to shepherding a nation. In verse 72, he says, And so he fed them, look at this, according to the integrity of his heart. And he guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. He had integrity of heart, which is what you need on the inside, and he had the skillfulness of his hands from practice on the outside, from doing the right things. And that's exactly how you lead properly. That's the source of true authority. Because if you don't have that kind of authority, your authority will not stand. And so you see that. I mean, consistently, you see pastors all the time. What was that guy down in, what was his name? Steve something, down in Texas. That's it, yeah. I think that's it. He just, just got... No, Steve Anderson, uh, yeah, that's the dude out west. Yeah, yeah same thing, same thing. Both, you know, telling his people to beat their wives and stuff. I mean, by that's an invalid authority. Oh. <laughs> You've been doing it wrong all these years. <laughs> but it's it, that's exactly that's exactly the kind of thing that happens. The other guy, um, I can't think of his name. Is way down south in Texas. Um, he'd been the pastor of the church for like forty-one years. Turns out, for the last five years, he'd had an inappropriate relation, relationship with a twenty-five-year-old girl. For five years now, apparently they'd never done anything. What? What then? What is the appropriate, inappropriate? I'm sorry, get out. Lawson, Steve Lawson, that's his name. Oh. Apparently, it's a bad time to be named Steve. Maybe I'll change my name. <laughs> Quinn, Quinn, Quinn. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll change my name. One by Quinn. I'm Quinn. I'm Quinn. <laughs> Steve's out of there. But that's but that's exactly. The, the kind of thing that you come up again, if you're not going to lead with integrity, if you're not going to lead with humility and keep your head down, if you're not going to lead by example and you're not going to do the right things, Jesus Christ has no problem cutting off heads. None whatsoever. The flower of grass, man, he'll cut that sucker right down. So that's, that's why you have to do 
anything that you do and act with absolute integrity to the best of your ability, pulling no punches. Because as uh, old Bob Jones Sr. used to say, to do less than your best is a sin. So do your best. Do your dead slap level best, and God will take care of the rest. He's absolutely, he's, he is the shepherd of your heart. He'll take care of you. So let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this lesson. I thank you for these folks here who, whether they know it or not, they are leaders. People look to them as an example, and that makes them a leader. Lord, I pray that you would continue to shepherd their hearts so that they can lead by example and continue to shepherd mine so that I lead by example. And that we can be an example to everyone around us, whether they like us or don't, doesn't really matter as long as you approve. I ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake.